Hello, so this is the video that will be replacing class for uh, this week's, uh, this Tuesday for Methods and Practice. So I want to kind of pick up where we were last week with um, first a, a segment continuing the discussion about small groups and, and kind of how they work, things to look for when you're observing small groups for your assignment for the course, but also uh, things to think about as you're leading small groups uh, either in the present or the future. So when we ended Tuesday we were discussing this idea that, that I kind of called the you know the canary in the coal mine in, in any group and, and I want to comment just a bit more about that. What My reason for kind of choosing that uh, metaphor for the kid in the group who's the least likely to engage is, um, is I, I think there's a tendency uh, in, in all groups, whether ministry groups or just groups of any kind, to, to take the individual who's on the outside, the individual who's on the fringe of the group, and, and marginalize them even further. You know, the, the reason they're not talking is because there's something wrong with them. You know, they, why don't they want to be here? Why don't they like us? Why don't they engage? And, and kind of to view um, them as the issue. And, and, and what I'm trying to suggest is, and what the canary metaphor uh, suggests, is that perhaps that kid is telling you something about the, the group that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, like if you were in, in counseling settings, in, in like family systems therapy, uh, they sometimes suggest, you know, like a, a family will go to counseling because, you know, junior is, uh, you know, shoplifting and, and got picked up for, you know, underage drinking, or, you know, the daughter in the family is, is maybe had a suicide attempt. And, and they, families will initially go to counseling with the idea that what is wrong with my kid? And, and sometimes there are very specific issues that that child is wrestling with. But what often, you know, kind of therapists and, and counselors will stress is that sometimes this kid is demonstrating behaviors that are symptoms of, of a problem that's more family-wide than it is just with them as an individual. That maybe there's dysfunction and unhealth in the larger family and it's just showing up in the behavior of this particular child. So, so I want to suggest something very similar. That I think sometimes, sometimes the kid that's not talking just is shy or is you know tired that night or had a rough day at home or at school or something and just isn't in the mood to talk but like the kids that kind of persistently um are are pretty closed off and, and persistently either physically remove themselves from the group a bit and that's something we'll talk about in a moment or or just refuse to engage and and, and very clearly are kind of walled off emotionally and otherwise from the group that may well be saying something about um something that has happened or is happening within the group. And it might be something related to you. I mean, one of the more um, intense experiences I've ever had in youth ministry was uh, kind of connecting with or trying to connect with uh, a, a, a now a college age kid who, who was in a, a potentially in a, in a group of college students I was working with, but that I had known since high school. And, and all of a sudden his behavior had gotten very uh, distant from the group and, and he wouldn't return calls from folks and he, he, he would he start quit coming to meetings very suddenly um, and and I connected with him assuming like hey what's going on is there something with somebody else if you had a, a you know falling out that we need to resolve and it turned out it was me it turned out that I had done things three years ago in high school when he was in high school I had led a different group and um, and not he I had not invited him to be a part of this particular group for there there was some reasons why it was a small um, tight uh, kind of invitation only group and he hadn't been a part of that and and that had really not sat well with him and he had stewed over that for some period of time so sometimes um, you know not to belabor that story but sometimes uh, the dysfunction that that kid is is manifesting. Is related to you, and we need to be. You need to be open to that. We need to be open to that. If, if we're the leader of the group, and, and perhaps it's us, perhaps there's something about the way we're leading, or the way something we've done in the group that has made a kid feel unsafe or unwelcome, or just has angered them. You know, and, and, and they need to somehow articulate that. But sometimes it's it's just 
you know, I, I don't feel like I know as much as everyone else. Everyone else seems to have all the answers, and, and I don't. I'm, I'm not as experienced with church or, or the Bible, or I just have questions and doubts, and I'm, I, I don't think I belong here in this group. And, and so um, one of the things I would recommend, um, and I'm going to be looking down at my notes periodically, so I apologize for the awkwardness of that. This whole thing is, is a bit awkward stylistically. So, so one of the things I, I think that relates to that is, is, is you can try to talk to that kid individually and, and sort of see like, hey, um, you know, I don't think you want to, what's wrong with you? You, know, you don't want to call a kid out even privately in that kind of way. But I think you can have conversations where you ask, you know, hey, would, we would love to hear more from you. And we're so glad you're there and excited that you're there. But, you know, what, what could help you maybe feel more comfortable at group? Or, or are there things, you know, that, that, that I could do or that we could do that would help you feel like you could engage and, and maybe share a bit more? And, um, sometimes a kid will tell you that. Um, and, and, and let you know, you know, what's going on or, or just even that invitation, just that you notice them will kind of maybe spur them to engage a bit more. Um, but I think there are also things you can do within the group that can help uh, draw them in. I, I think one, and, and we're, again, in a few minutes, we're going to talk a little more about the physical spacing. Um, I, I alluded to this last Tuesday. I, one of the things that often kids will, if they're, they've kind of shut themselves off or anybody in a group, um, well, sometimes do that, you know, they'll cross their arms or they won't make eye contact or, you know, they're, if people are reading the Bible, they won't engage with that. But also often folks physically move themselves out of the group, out of the circle. And that may be subtle. I mean, it may be just a foot or two back or maybe they just turn their chair a bit to the side or if there's some barrier, a couch or, or something that they can or a corner of the room that they can sort of sit around so that they're not, you know, whatever they are doing, they're, they're, they're taking themselves out of if there's a circle or, you know, a, a, a space where everyone can see everyone else, they will remove themselves from it. So, so I think one thing you can do without calling them out is, is you know, at the beginning of the group, just say, hey, let's all, let's all be in the circle. You know, and, ah, oh, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sit back here. No, 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 please, please, you know, let, let's all come in and be together. And I, I think that just physical proximity really can be important and, and, and kind of being physically in the group can help a, a young person feel that they're emotionally more there or able to engage more. I think also conversationally. I, I think some kids, um, you know, two things that I think help uh, just in, in terms of leading and facilitating that curating the conversation that we were talking about last Tuesday um, one of the things related to that is, is some folks will immediately be ready to talk. You know, as soon as a question is asked, they, they want to jump in. Sometimes they haven't even formulated their thought, but they know they have one. And, and so they'll just start talking and they're think, you can see them thinking as they're speaking. Other folks, maybe they're just holding out for the group because they process slower. So one thing you can do to kind of bring in more folks conversationally into the group is just slow down. You know, say, throw out a question and say, Let, let's just take a moment and before anyone comments, before anyone, you know, jumps in with an answer, let, let's just think about that. Um, and maybe you've done this in classes where a teacher says, jot down a thought or two, right? And, and you know, not taking five minutes, just even 30 seconds. You know, take, take a moment to jot down an idea. Take a moment to think about one thing related to this question or that question. Um, sometimes just that little bit of space can give kind of the more deliberate, more thoughtful, slower moving, uh, you know, participant in the group time to kind of, okay, I, I have something I could say. Um, whereas if you just let, let things flow, kind of the kid that's the activator, the kid that's outgoing and confident um, is it, just going to, you know, if, if you have three or four of those kids, they're just going to repeatedly jump in and kids that need a little more time are, are going to hold back. Um, I think also, and, and, and this, you know, relates to, a, 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 again, a topic I want to come to in a moment of like what to do with kind of the over talker, you know, the kid that talks too much. So sometimes you have a group of eight students or six students or whatever, and they all get along. They all like each other just fine. But like two or three of them just tend to really dominate conversation. They're outgoing. They're confident. They maybe are really experienced in the youth group. They have a lot to say. Um, and they, without sometimes knowing it, will, you know, if you look back on, you know, if you've mapped out an hour's worth of conversation, they've 
talked for you know, 45 percent, you know, 45 minutes of that hour or something. Um, so I think uh, there's various strategies you can employ to kind of rein that young person in. But one thing that I think helps is, is to ask kids directly questions, you know, to kind of say, hey, I, we really want to hear from everybody tonight. You know, so so some of the part of the evening will just it'll be a free for all and a fruit basket toss up or whatever. And, you know, anybody that wants to talk can. But but at various points, you know, I, I may just call on folks by name and, 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 you know, you're always free to take a pass if you're not comfortable with the question or don't want to talk. But um, but we'd really love to hear from everyone, you know, and, and it's, I would recommend doing that on the front end of the group so that a kid just isn't floored with like, oh, my gosh, you know, we've had half an hour of just you know, random people talking, and now you're singling me out, and you're pointing at me, and you're calling on me specifically, and what, what's going on? Did I do something wrong, or are you trying to embarrass me? I mean, to kind of give forewarning that, yeah, hey, at, at various points in the evening, would really, really hope everyone will talk, and, and, you know, don't be surprised if at some point, you know, maybe I even call on folks just to hear, um, and then, and then I think when you do, just to kind of gently and, and um, you know, kind of with care, kind of invite them in you know, and, and invite them into the space. And, and I, I, I think there's ways you can do that. I, I think also, you know, as I said, kind of talking to those those young people privately can also be helpful. All right, so those are a few things uh, going on with uh, those quiet kids, those kids that aren't engaged. And again, I, maybe one last thing, um, it is the type of questions that we ask. And this is true, not just of quiet kids, but, but also impacts just the quality of, of group conversation generally. I mean, I think there's a tendency to fall back on easy to come up with, but really ineffective questions, right? So what do you think? Um, you know, sure, maybe that gets a great conversation going, but that's often so open-ended, so vague and broad that, well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what you want me to talk about. Or, or uh, I think another kind of opposite side of that are questions that are so directive, so, you know, yes, no kind of questions that, uh, so, you know, do you think Jesus was a good guy? Yes. Okay, well, where do you really go for that, right? Like, how do you ask a question that invites a, a longer statement? You know, like, how do you ask a question that doesn't lead to just yes or no answers or one-word answers, but, but leads to more dialogue? Um, I think often one thing I've done is, is you know, and, and I'm sure many of you have, have done this yourselves in your conversations or you've experienced this in class. You know, a, a student in class will, will give an answer, and it's a good answer, but it's really short. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, like they, they've cracked the door open of the concept, but they haven't really walked through it, you know. So to say, well, hey, could you say more about that? that that's very interesting. I, I really like, I'm intrigued by that answer, by your comment there. What more, you know, could you, do you have more that you could say about that? Or could you unpack that a little bit? And, and I think often kind of that invitation may help draw students out. Um, but again, I think, you know, that, that quiet kid is a little bit like, you know, a, a wild animal that you're trying to coax in, you know, to, to pet or something. Like, like, you have to be pretty gentle with it, you know, and, and I think being very aware that there's probably a whole host of reasons why they're nervous about talking a lot in the group. And so, um, you know, how, how do you kind of ease them in and invite them in? Um, one one other thing, I kind of conversationally, generally in groups, uh, I, this is something I'd like for you to watch for when you observe your groups, but also to think about when you're leading them. So say you've got, uh, again, you're leading a Bible study, you know, like that's your task. You're the youth pastor or you're running a Young Life campaign or group, and you're leading a Bible study on this chapter in the Gospel of John or from Romans or whatever. I think it can be tempting to feel like, okay, to do my job, we got to get going, right? Like we got to get going on content and bam, you know, like we really need to start because otherwise we're just wasting time, right? We're goofing around. Um, I, I would say, you know, one of the things that you, you really want to give thought to is how do you get conversation going? So sometimes if you're in a group that knows each other well and everybody is pretty committed to the idea of the group, you can do that. Okay, hey, welcome. We're here. We're here for Bible study. Let's open our Bibles. Let's read this passage. Bam. Everybody just jumps in. Um, but sometimes whether, it, you know, maybe it's kids don't know each other all that well. You know, they're, they're classmates at school, but they're not an intimate social group. 
or or sometimes maybe they're you know they're sort of into this Bible study thing, but you're not really sure how engaged or how comfortable they feel. Um, you know, ice breaking. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all probably familiar with like cheesy or awkward icebreakers, but I think there's something really valid to kind of easing folks into conversation. And and so I, I, I think you've probably, most of us have been in groups that, okay, hey, let's start with a warm up question. How was your week? Or what was, what's your favorite cereal? Or, you know, like, like, like some easy kind of question that everybody has an answer for. You know, everybody has had some kind of day, you know, that they could comment on, has had like what was the best thing that happened this week or what was the worst or uh, what was something, in, you know, what's the most recent movie that you saw that was really interesting or, you know, like, like some conversation, some question that can kind of get them going and get them talking. And typically I, I think like, again, if you're doing an hour in a small group, you don't want that to be a huge percentage of the time, but you want it to be long enough to kind of, so that people now feel comfortable. And I think part of curating the group is recognizing Okay, now let's segue. Let's move into let's let's turn to content. Um, kind of one last thing with those shy and quiet kids. So say you're you're you've asked a question like that, and and the really loquacious, outgoing kids are telling some story about this movie they saw, and it's really fascinating, and you know, and they're just they just think it's hilarious, and they're going on and on, and maybe it is really fun. Maybe everybody's really engaged, but like they're. They're kind of outgoing. They're wired up. You know, they're going to talk for 20 minutes, perhaps. Like with that kind of kid, because they don't really need to be warmed up. They they came in hot and ready to go. Like, like okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're, let's finish that story later. Let's get going on the content. But but sometimes those warm up questions, uh, the quiet kid will surprise you. You know, the quiet kid will like, oh gosh. You asked just the right question. You asked about our favorite video game or, or some movie we saw, and they will start to talk. And, and, and all of a sudden, they're being more animated and outgoing than they ever are. You know, it, you've never seen them like this in the group. My recommendation, and this is you know, just my personal opinion about this, I would say, okay, this is what needs to happen right now. You know, like, okay, so maybe we're 10 or 15, 20 minutes into the check-in time or the warm-up question or the icebreaker, um, but Jimmy's finally talking, you know, or, or Susie, who hasn't said a word in six weeks in this group, is, is really interested in, in, in telling a story, and she's animated, and she's excited about it. I say, okay, well, let's just, maybe not for the whole evening, but like, okay, let, let's set the Bible study aside. We can get to that. You know, we'll get to that in a bit. But, the, you know, the, this kid who, who really has been closed off all of a sudden isn't. And, and, and if that's the case... I, I would really respond differently than I would to the outgoing kid. I would say, hey, as long as, as you really are in the flow of this conversation and people are engaged with you and, and you're participating in a way that we haven't seen, I, we'll just sit here for a little while. You know, like, th there's no hurry. You know, there's other times, you know, that we'll, we'll really work through content and we'll get there. But, but in, in this time, this is what the Holy Spirit's doing, you know, and, and, and maybe the... God's work tonight in the group is is just that you felt comfortable to finally talk, you know, and and, and so what if it wasn't about the Bible? You know, I, again, you know, there would be different theories, different approaches to that, but that would be my, you know, personal thoughts on that. Okay, a few more kind of group dynamic thoughts. I'm going to try to move through these a little more expeditiously and quickly um, just to give you things to think about both, again, as you lead, but also as you're watching. Um Space, the use of space, I, I, I think is, is an off neglected. I think we just kind of take, like probably most of us have some idea that a circle is a fairly good form, but I think it is. You know, like, I, I think part of why you want that eight to 10 or, you know, four to 10 size group is that you can all sit easily in a circle and see each other and hear each other. The bigger that circle gets, you know, you've maybe all of us have been in a circle of 40 or 50 people and like people seem like they're half a mile away. You know, all the way across the room, you can't really make eye contact. You can't see each other. But sitting in a circle, I, I think, is often a, a really good thing. Um, comfortable seating, but not too comfortable. You know, like, like, like there's often sort of balancing acts with some of these. I don't. I think you want to be in a comfortable setting. You know, if, if you're wanting kids to, to act like they're familiar, act like they're at home, um, maybe the place needs to feel a little bit like that. You know, so, um, you know, sitting in pews in a church are, are that is not necessarily a comfortable setting you're sitting in rows you know sitting in rows like we do in class that's not an ideal conversational setting 
you know, to turn, okay, let, let's sit and face together. Let's be in comfortable chairs. Um, kind of the balancing act with that is, okay, if you have just, you know, like barca loungers and couches that everyone just sinks into and falls asleep, you know, or is so comfortable that they just kind of slouch and, and yeah, nod off or, you know, whatever, that, that, that's problematic. So, so comfortable, but not, you know, so much so that it, it, it lends to kids. Sleeping, I think, is, is a thing. Um, a, a surprising deal with space, or at least it was very surprising to me when I first read studies about this. Um, it, it, I think we often assume, like, well, you want kids to be comfortable, so you want them to have room, right? Um, but there, there are, you know, study after study suggests that, that if you have a group in a room that is too big for the size of the group, it loses energy immediately, the, the group does. Right, like, and probably all of us have like maybe you've been to a sporting event, right? Like if you go to um, a George Fox Friday night basketball game, and there's 600 folks in Wheeler, which would be a pretty big game, uh, that would feel huge. Like there'd be tons of energy in the gym, and it would feel like, man, it's palpable. Like you can just feel the buzz, kind of of of, of the gym being packed, the gym being pretty full. Um, but if you took 600 people and put them in Autzen Stadium, you know, or put them in the Rose Garden, you know, uh, the Moda Center, you know, a place that holds 20,000 or 50,000, all of a sudden 600 feels like there's absolutely no one there, right? They have spread out so much that the energy is entirely lost by, by that. Well, the same thing works in groups, right? So if you're, um, if you, uh, you know, if you've got 50 kids coming to your youth group, you ought to be in a room that, that comfortably holds about 55, you know, like, so you don't want kids to be uncomfortable and, and gosh, I, I you know, after sitting for an hour, I'm, I'm, I'm cramped up because we were all so tightly packed, but you want it to feel like, wow, this thing is full. And, and, and not even that a kid necessarily is going to cognitively say that, although sometimes they will, but just you, you feel it. I mean, you feel the energy from being in, in kind of a, a pretty full space. So, um, so again, like if you're leading a Bible study that has six kids, um, you probably don't want to go to the middle of the Canyon Commons, right? Like, like picture if, if the Canyon Commons were empty and, and, and you had a table full of six folks sitting square in the middle of it, it would feel like it was echoey and cavernous and, you know, and, and most of the energy of that time would be lost. But imagine you're at a booth at Sherry's, you know, or, 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 or in a, an apartment. And you've got six to eight, you know, ten folks sitting around an apartment living room. Well, that just feels like wow, there's so much energy here, right? So, so thinking about um, how you configure folks, probably in a circle. Thinking about where, um, probably in you know a space that's not crowded but also not empty, you know. And 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 what's counterintuitive is that most folks say better to err on the slightly crowded side than the Slightly, you know, if you're going to be, are we going to be in this huge room where there's not very many of us or in a room that's, it's big enough, but boy, if we added a couple more folks, it'd be cramped, go for the second option, right? Like that, that, that typically, um, it, it will just feel a little more alive, a little more energetic, um, by being in that place. Um, again, there's, there's pros and cons to public spaces versus private spaces. Uh, another counterintuitive thing with groups is that sometimes, a little bit of ambient noise going on around you. Um, again, if there's too much, it's, it's hard to have a conversation. You know, like you can't hear each other. And especially if you're wanting to talk vulnerably, right? You know, if you're in a restaurant and you're, you know, or, or a really loud public space and you're having to yell to be heard, you know, kids not going to talk about their struggles with cutting, you know, or, or the struggles with the sexual abuse they've had or, or profound doubts and concerns they have in their faith. Um, but at the same token, a, a deadly silent space also can be intimidating for the same reasons. You know, to be in a space that seems echoey, it can feel like everything I'm saying is so loud. So sometimes being in a, a, a like a public adjacent space or, a, you know, a side area in a public restaurant or coffee shop or something or, you know, a corner, uh, often a corner in a, in a room, uh, even a larger room can help dissipate you know, like the, the having two, two walls can help it feel a little more private, but also then having the open space can help it not feel claustrophobic or, or 
like, gosh, who's outside of this room listening to me? Um, or, or just being in an apartment with a little bit of music going on. You know, again, not so much so that it's distracting, that it overwhelms uh, the, the time, or that um, you know people start to hear the song and they start to listen to that or sing along with that. But sometimes just having a little bit of extra noise um, can be helpful. I, I mean, not in every setting, and some folks wouldn't wouldn't want to do that all the time. Um, but but that can be that can be a thing that matters. Um, one thing to watch, I, I want you to watch this when you go to see a group, and you, you might have to ask some questions. Um, but certainly if you're leading groups, is, is how guests change dynamics, right? So, and this is a real tension. Like on the one hand, you're, you're leading a Christian ministry. You want more, you know, of course we want you to bring your friends. Of course uh, having a guest come and join the group, you know, somebody's best friend or something has heard me talk about this Bible study and wanted to come check it out. That's awesome. Right, and, and, and you want to have a welcoming, inviting atmosphere in that regard. But that will, that will automatically change how the group functions, right? Um, if nothing else, the, the person that did the inviting will now not interact with the rest of the group the way they normally would. You know, if Jimmy invites his friend Bob, you know, maybe normally Jimmy talks to everybody in the group in, in you know, X kind of ways, but now you know, a large percentage of his energy that evening is going to be turned to this guest. And and maybe that's really productive, trying to make the guest feel welcome, but sometimes it's not. Like, sometimes they then sort of engage in their own private little relationship and, you know, how they talk outside of the group and, and like, what's gotten into Jimmy? Like, you know, like, he's really acting strange tonight since he brought his friend Bob. Like, he's not himself. Um, but that will also change the dynamic of how people share. Not always. I mean, sometimes the guest is somebody that is known to everyone in the group and, and they feel just as comfortable to share honestly and vulnerably with this new person because of outside history. Um, but often a guest, like, oh, you know, like the last couple of weeks, we've, we've really been talking about some personal or private stuff, but now there's this new person here and, and I'm not sure I, I'm, you know, willing to do that. And, and, and maybe you know, while it's great to have this new person, you might find the conversation kind of takes on a very different tenor. You know, maybe it stays a lot more shallow that evening. Um, so, so guests and how to navigate them, how to, is your group fluid? You know, is it a group of, no. I mean, I, I alluded to a story earlier where I had a fixed group of kids. There were eight students. And for a very specific reason, I invited those eight and only those eight to be in this semester-long group. Um, and, and some really powerful things happen, but that obviously meant some kids were excluded, right? So, so thinking about, you know, one issue down the line for when you're leading groups is are, are groups open-ended? Like, hey, anybody can come. Any freshman boy that wants to be in the freshman guys Bible study can come. Or we're doing this co-ed book group, uh, you know, on Tuesday mornings before school at, at chapters you know and, and anyone can come or is it like hey this is the group one way kind of around that is, is, is to kind of negotiate periods of time like okay it is a closed group for six weeks you know we're going to do this we're going to walk through the gospel of mark and that's going to be a eight, a 10 week thing and for that time it's fixed this is you know like these are the only people in it but then after that we'll start another one and, and so if you're interested in checking it out or if you didn't get in on the first one There'll be chances to you know join later, but but considering how um, regular attendees versus guests, how they interact with one another really will impact how a group functions. I mean, you can pretty quickly tell if you're observing or taking part in a group that okay, this group has been together for a while. You know, they have inside jokes, they have traditions, they have rituals. You know, sometimes that they don't even recognize, but they always do the same things. They always kind of make the same sort of jokes. Um, and then when you start bringing in a person or two, sometimes they bring wonderful new stuff, but they change things. The group is going to be different by bringing in guests. So that's something to consider. All right, so so those are, we will continue to talk about small groups, but that's at least a, some stuff to get you going on this observation assignment and, and to begin thinking about how you might lead groups down the line. So, so as you go and watch and observe these groups, I, I'd kind of like you to make comments about almost all of the things we talked about in class last week 
than here in this first half hour. Um, you know, from how did the conversation flow? How serious was it? How um, did everyone participate and, and how so? Like, were there a few people that dominated? Kind of doing the conversation map of, of lining out. Like, did all conversations go back to the leader? Which is a very common thing to do. Um, you know, even, even in a fairly mature, healthy group, like oftentimes a leader will ask a question and, and folks will respond to her. You know, respond back to that leader and not to each other. Uh, I, I think you really see a great conversation when maybe the leader asks a question and then one student responds to her and then a second student responds to the first. And before you know it, like they're not just talking to you or just talking to the leader of the group, but they're talking to each other. And, and the conversation is building upon itself. And then the leader can join back in as a peer, you know, as I'm, I'm just one of the folks talking, not I'm the one driving it, you know. And, and if I stop asking questions, the conversation dies. Um, or, or that every conversation funnels through me. Like, and, and you can see that. You'll see that in the groups you observe. A, a decent number of you will run. And there'll be decent groups. I mean, there'll be people that like each other and, and maybe have pretty good conversations, but group after group where every answer is directed back to the leader. You know, like sometimes looking for approval or sometimes, well, you ask the question, so I'm, I'm just answering you and then nobody else builds on that. And the leader has to ask another question, right? So, so watch, see how that goes. I also really want you to observe in the group and think about in groups you're leading the use of humor. Okay, so this is a big topic. Uh, later in the semester, we'll spend more time, a, a class or two, just expressly talking about how do we think about humor in ministry. Um, Young Life, my background, is, is a ministry that loves humor, loves in every setting. There's never a Young Life setting where it's, okay, this is so serious that, that we're not going to make some jokes. We're not going to have some fun here. Um, so I come from a background of really, really loving that, and, and I, I do as well. I mean, I like to be in classes that are fun. I, I like to joke around. I, I think that's very positive. Um, but humor is a real double-edged sword. I mean, when it's good, when it's healthy, when it's when it draws the group in, there's not there's very few things that are more powerful. I mean, I, I and well, again, later in the semester, I, I want to talk about like I think it can be a holy and deeply spiritual thing to just laugh together in a group. And to do that in, in, in you know ways that just draws everyone in, and, and you're just oh, you you've lost yourself in, in how much fun you're having. I, I think that is a wonderful thing. But I think we've all been in, in humorous situations where it's fun for a few people, but there's other people that feel like they're maybe the target of the humor, or or if not the target tonight, they're nervous that next week they might be. You know, like there's some kind of cultures of humor that can develop in groups that are. Uh, Kind of predatory i i think would be really the best word that you know like that you know there's folks in the group that are funny you know and and and, and sarcastic and make jokes regularly but you can kind of sense them in the group sort of waiting on who's going to say something stupid tonight who's going to say something that i can kind of jump in and, and make fun of and ridicule and i think when that's happening in a group humor loses all of that sense of the holy, all of that sense of the helpful and the fun, and really can become uh, toxic. It can become wounding, uh, as, as well as just shutting down conversation. You know, like, like I'll be damned if I'm going to say something real or honest, because I don't know whether you're going to take me seriously or laugh at me. You know, because I, I remember last time, you know, when so-and-so shared something and, and people made a joke about it. You know, and maybe only one person did. But so I think one of the things when you're leading groups is, is what kind of culture of humor do you want to establish? Um, I mean, I, I don't think our, ours is a culture that loves comedy, loves humor, but it's also a culture where so much of that is hurtful and divisive and uh, belittling of others. Right. So, so as you're leading a group, how do you foster humor that, that draws folks in humor that creates a spirit of shalom? rather than humor that isolates and, and ridicules and, and makes people fearful, right? So, so thinking about humor in your own leadership, which we'll do more later in the semester, but also in the groups that you observe, how, how are they talking about humor? So we just have a, a brief, about we're going to take about 15 minutes here, and, and I want to talk a little bit, introductory, some introductory comments about Made to Stick. Um, so there's a number of things we're going to talk about as that book goes. Um, 
I, I want to, I, I don't know how you're feeling as you get going in, in the book. Um, my guess is some of you are really enjoying it. Maybe others feel a little uncomfortable. Again, as we alluded to the very first day of class, it's a book about advertising. I mean, that's the context in which it's written is, is like, how, though these are ad guys, you know, one that works for an ad agency and another that teaches um, communications at Stanford, but communications in their business school, which is basically like how to, how to communicate beautifully and powerfully so that you can sell products. Right. So, so I think in ministry, none of us want to be uh, selling or manipulating young people. Like, like you don't want to be, okay, I'm working to be so effective in talks that I, I, I can trick kids into loving Jesus or trick kids into being a Christian. And I think we need to safeguard against that. At the same time, um, you want to be, you know, Scripture encourages us to do everything we do as if for the Lord, to do it, do our very best, right? And if you're peeling a potato, you know, you want to peel it for God's glory. If you are uh, an athlete, you want to, you know, compete in your sport to the best you can to God's glory. If you're giving a talk to a room full of middle school kids or high school kids, you want to communicate as clearly and beautifully and powerfully as you can, right? So I think there's a, there's a line between manipulation and professionalism, right? And, and I think hopefully our conversation around communication from May to Stick and, and these other texts will be in the professional realm, like, like that we will avoid anything that might lead to manipulation. But we do want to honestly talk about how do you do stuff well? How do you communicate the beauty of the gospel? I mean, this is not just, hey, communicate well so that you'll buy an iPhone. You know, or you'll buy a razor or, you know, some crap product. This is, how do I talk about the most beautiful uh, message in the world? That, that God is real, that God cares for us, loves for us, that God has come to us in Jesus, that Jesus has died on the cross. You know, all the things that go into the Christian gospel that we desperately want to communicate with young people. So I think it behooves us to, to think, I want to be a professional at that. Like, I, I want to get better. Like, I don't, like, yes, on the one hand, it's never wasted if you just get up and, and speak about Jesus or read scripture. Like, like on the Holy Spirit can use that. And, and the Holy Spirit uses people all the time that are not professional speakers, that are not beautifully eloquent or hilariously funny. Um, they, absolutely. And, and I don't think any, I don't want any of you to feel pressure to be like, gosh, they're going to come in and record my TED talk tomorrow because I'm so darn good at this immediately. Um, but I think we all want to be better at what we do, right? And, and if communicating about God to young people is what you're going to be doing as a volunteer or a professional, you want to do that as best you can, right? So, so that's, again, we talked a little bit about that the first day, but just why we're doing this book, why we're going to talk about technique and, and technique is sometimes a, a, you know, like a, 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 an idea or a word that has kind of a cheap, kind of tawdry connotation to it. That like somehow as a Christian, I ought to just be authentic. Yes, you do want to be authentic and real, but you also want to do well, right? So we're going to talk about that. So this first idea out of the gate in the book is this, the first chapter is this idea of simplicity. Okay, so I, I just want to make a few comments. In some ways, these are just supporting and augmenting the themes of the chapter. But, but I really think, I, I, as I was alluding to a moment ago, I mean, when you stand up in front of a room of high school kids or, or lead a Bible study with eight freshman girls or, you know, six eighth grade boys or whatever context you might be in, think of what you're trying to do, right? Like you are trying to take A, the God that transcends all being, like that transcends all our understanding, that, that is beyond anything we can imagine, that has loved us in a way, you know, scripture talks about how wide and deep, high and deep is the love of God, that transcends all understanding, right? And, and, and you now have the job in 12 minutes of talking to a room full of, of high school kids about that. Like how in the world are you going to take something so big so profound and communicated. Um, and, and that's where their idea of simplicity, I think, is so important. Um, 
it can be so, so tempting in all communication to overcomplicate things. Um, but particularly on something like this that is kind of complicated to begin with, you know, like the doctrine of atonement, how Jesus saves us by dying on the cross. I mean, you could write a thousand page book on that. People have. There are hundreds of books that are hundreds of pages about this topic. You have 12 minutes, 10 minutes, you know, to talk to kids that have never thought about that, you know, and, and that are 14 years old, 15 years old. So um, I think one of the things, uh, you know, that, that really is the challenge for all of us communicating our whole lives, but particularly when you're starting, is, is, is to resist the temptation to, to feel like saying more is saying better. You know, that, okay, I, I'm not really sure quite how to do this. This is such a big topic. So I'm just going to talk really fast. I'm going to take lots and have lots of notes. I'm going to cram in several ideas. And one of the things they said in that chapter, you know, if you say three things, you've said nothing. And, and, and like sometimes you will give a talk where you do say more than this. I mean, in this video, I've hit several points, you know. It's not that like every time you communicate, you can only make one point. But I would recommend in any talk that you give to a room full of middle school or high school kids, that principle is true. You know, like, like say one thing. Like what is the one thing you want to communicate tonight? You know, so, so when you're talking about this parable from the life of Jesus or something, you know, sermon, something from the Sermon on the Mount, there might be four or five excellent points that you could comment on when Jesus talks to the woman at the well. Pick one. Like, 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 so really do the work of wrestling with a passage, wrestling with a theological concept until you can say, okay, of all the things happening in this story, here's the one thing, right? Here's the lead, as they talk about in the book. You don't want to bury the lead. Like, here, here is the point. And, and, and I'm only going to say things that are going to help build to that one point. How do I say that point as clearly as possible? So, so two things um, related to that uh, before we wrap up. To me, one of the masters of this, and, and I recommend reading his books for many reasons. He's a beautiful writer, a very clear thinker, and, and has helped so many people over the years, is, is the Christian author C.S. Lewis. And, and probably many of you have read various C.S. Lewis books. Um, but C.S. Lewis was a professor at Oxford, you know, was fully capable of talking in ways that were utterly unintelligible to, to you and me. You know, like he had read enough, researched enough, moved in circles where, you know, the level of vocabulary, the level of kind of referencing other texts, referencing other scholars would, would happen a million miles an hour without footnotes, without, you know, uh, that only people with PhDs and very narrow topics could possibly understand what he was saying. He could have done that all day long. Uh, and, and at times, in his writing, does do that when he's writing for that audience. But one of the things that makes C.S. Lewis uh, so helpful and as why his works have, have been so powerful over the years is that he was brilliant at taking ideas up on that level and bringing them down putting the cookies on the lower shelf, you know, like, and not in a way that dumbed down the issue. Like, like he would take a complex idea and be faithful to it. Like, it would still be the true idea, not a bastardized, cheap inversion, but he would boil it down, boil it down, boil it down to its most simple elements, and then communicate those in clear, plain language. So, I, I remember when I first was going to seminary, doing graduate work in theology, and I was still doing Young Life at the same time. So I would be reading these books or going to these classes and, you know, learning new vocabulary, learning new concepts. And, and they were rumbling around in my head all the time. And it was very difficult to not then stand up, you know, after class all day to stand up that evening at youth group or at Young Life and, and, and have that same vocabulary bleed into my Young Life talks. Um, but whenever I did do that, it was a disaster, right? Because... Kids don't know that language. They don't know what perichoresis is. You know, they don't they don't know what consubstantiality. You know, like any of those kind of terms. And and maybe those are helpful for you to understand a concept. But then, how do you take that? I, I mean, I true brilliance in many ways is to take a, a complex idea and make it simple. 
right? And, and, and reading people that have done that. I mean, read some of C.S. Lewis's stuff. Some of his richest theology comes off in the children's stories, the Chronicles of Narnia, like where he's taking the idea of like the incarnation or the atonement or sanctification, like really big, complex spiritual ideas, and he, he works them into children's stories. And, and he doesn't cheapen the concept but he, he explains it so clearly and beautifully that, that a six-year-old kid can understand it, right? Like that, that takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of practice, but boy, when you, when you start to develop some ability to do that, your ability to communicate the gospel, to communicate any idea, is going to be greatly enhanced. So, so that's the work that you do outside of your talk, you know, is, is boil it down, boil it down. And, and related to that, um, kind of coming back to the, if you th say three things, you've only said, you've said nothing. Um, there's a quote that I read. This is a quote about writing fiction. It was actually written by a novelist. Um, but I read it in the context uh, in a preaching class in graduate school. And I, I think it really serves well here as well. Um, and that is that the hardest, one of the hardest parts about writing is you have to kill your children. Right? Uh, the, the, this kind of author talking about being a novelist, that you have to you know, you're over and over again faced with the need to kill your children. Uh, and, and, and what she was trying to say it with that is killing, editing out words. Like, oh, I had this great paragraph where I described this and I really kind of, I, I kind of like my little turn of phrase here. I feel, does it help the overall picture? No. Okay, kill it. Cut it out. But there's so much going on in this story. You know, Jesus is doing this. I, 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 it's all important. I want to, no, it's not. You know, like really being willing to say, okay, what's the one thing? Like, what is the one deal that I want to communicate here tonight? And anything that doesn't serve that, no matter how funny it is, no matter how interesting I find it, no, ma no matter how, you know, in another sermon, another talk, it might be the important thing, but it's not tonight, right? So taking a story, taking a biblical text, taking a concept, and being willing to, to kill your children. Like being willing to say, oh, this is good stuff. It's going to land on the editor's floor. You know, like when you're editing a movie, the director's cut is never shorter than the final product, right? The director's cut is two or three times longer. And, and sometimes you watch this, oh, that's a really interesting scene. Why did they cut it? It didn't serve the overall, the one thing the movie was trying to do. You know, and so it, it didn't get cut. It got cut. It, it, it got edited out. And, and having... You know, doing the work of thinking about that. You know, like a, a longer talk is not a better talk. You know, a I, I mean, I know it's popular in kind of the hipster churches of Portland that'll have like 45 minute, hour and 10 minute sermons. I think almost invariably that's a mistake, in all honesty. You know, like I think even in a church to a room full of adults, you know, in a sermon to a room full of adults, you're probably better taking 20 to 30 minutes saying, here's one, maybe two, three ideas. And there's other stuff we could say, that's for another time. Like, I, I, I want to say one or two things really clearly, really well. And, and, and I hope you'll remember those. I mean, I often feel like at the end of a semester with a class, if you remember one thing from a college class you've taken 10 years from now, that was a really you know, significant class. My guess is most of us, three years after the courses we've taken, we can barely remember anything, right? So if that's true for a whole semester, imagine what it's like for a night at youth group. You know, like, could a kid go home and say, what was tonight's talk about? It was about this. You know, Kylene said, here, here was the point. Andrea tonight said, this is the, you know, like, here's the one thing. And, and it was clear, and I understood it, and it was... You know, the other things that we'll talk about in the book, it was, it was concrete, it was told in a story. You know, the made-to-stick stuff is, is real. Um, but I think the first idea of less is often more. And, and in fact, less is almost always more when it comes to communicating. I don't feel like adding layers of complexity or adding more points is going to enhance your, your talk. Uh, in most cases, it's not. You know, spend time working, spend time researching, so that you have good stuff to choose from, but then pick one or two things, you know, and here's, here's, this is all I want to say tonight. And once I say that, say it clearly, I'm going to stop. And maybe I could have taken 20 minutes, but 
but I got it done in 10, we'll just stop. That's enough. And on that note, let's stop for the evening. It's, it's a little less time than, than we would normally have in class, um, but it gives you some material to, to go with, uh, and I'll be back next week. Thanks.